All right, we're ready to go? Ready. I'm going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to turn to the scriptures. Father, we give you thanks for this day. The creation for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is dead. And Father, we thank you that you are present here with us as we study the scriptures. We pray now that you will take our minds and think through them. You will take my lips and speak through them. And above all, that you will take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and for our neighbor. As we ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Can you put it on the table? Right. Tim needs to meet everybody. Uh, well, everybody's not muted. Can we get that taken care of? Can you take care of the mute? Button? Off the camera. Tim, we can't hear you. Hey, I, mute, I muted everyone, but why I'm still hearing people, I don't know. All right, I unmute. Now we're going to mute again. Mute. All. Everyone has to mute themselves. Well, that's true. Everybody can mute their, themselves. Okay. Okay, here we are. Mute all. I think you got it. Billy's muted now. Read a passage from Romans Billy, 9. No, Billy, I'm trying to... Uh, that's good. Well, I'm trying to find Billy to unmute him. You did. Okay, I'm going to mute all. Oh, and then. Where's Billy? You hear me? I can now, yes. All right. I'm going to go start. So I'm going to begin by reading this passage from Romans chapter 9. Um, the first uh, five, maybe six verses at most. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. But I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Now, this is the opening part of a whole new unit in the book of uh, Romans, uh, which is going to run from Romans chapter 9, verse 1, until the end of verse 11, uh, chapter 11, to the very end of chapter 11. Now, in some ways, it represents a, a, a complete interlude uh, compared to what we have elsewhere in the book. You could take out these two chapters, or three chapters, 9, 10, 11, and jump straight <clears throat> from uh, the end of chapter 8 to the beginning of chapter 12, and you wouldn't miss a beat. Now, what Paul has done in uh, the early material, in chapters 1 to 8, basically, is to lay out what you would call the doctrinal foundations of the Christian faith. So after his opening greetings, he raised, lays out the reality of sin, which uh, is, the, is, is the case for both Gentiles and Jews. Sin is confronted by the solution of grace, which is received by faith in Jesus. And so you have then that long section on justification by grace through faith, and then chapter 8, that extraordinary and wonderful pa passage on the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and elsewhere, giving us assurance. And if you move to chapter 12, 
that's also a beautifully well well crafted unit, and it has to do with what happens if you take what Paul's arguing in the first eight chapters seriously. And what what you see there is that our whole lives then have to be reoriented. They have to be recalibrated. So we have to recalibrate our relationship to the state. Uh, initially, the relationship to each other in the church, then the state, <clears throat> then uh, recalibrating our relationship to those whom Paul calls weaker brothers. And then he finishes with uh, a, a beautiful set of uh, personal readings to a variety of people that are in Rome. Now, as I say, Romans 9 to 11 is a, is a complete break from the way he's argued in the first eight chapters and in the last four chapters. So the question is, what's he doing here? Well, what he's doing is that he's, he's dealing with um, an acute problem that emerged in the first century of the Christian um, missionary work. Now, all of this is, is captured brilliantly in, in, in Acts, uh, but what, what you get in uh, these two chapters, three chapters, is he's dealing with the problem of what do you do when a significant number of fellow Jews, Paul is speaking as a Jew, when a significant number of fellow Jews don't believe? Now, we're going to look in detail how Paul unpacks that problem, but I'm going to take a fair bit of time this morning uh, to sort of lay out just what that problem is and the, the functional equivalent of it in our own day because I don't think this is a problem simply that uh, is, is for Paul in the first century. I think it's a problem that shows up in uh, our, our own day and generation. So to put the issue again, what, what Paul's wrestling with is uh, what are you going to do when so many Jews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah? Now that in turn then leads to a cluster of, uh, of issues that I'll, on, I'll name and I'll name them in terms of what happened in the first century, and I'll name them in terms of what's happening in our day and generation, and they're very important and very interesting. So the opening question is that how come then do so many Jews not accept Jesus as the Messiah? And the first question beyond that is, is, is this because of a moral failure on God's part? Uh, does this show that God is not just? He's been so gracious, he's been so good to the Jewish people, and now he suddenly turned his backs on them. Is, is it the fact that, that is, it, is the problem lying with God? Is, is that what's behind this? So that's one of the issues that Paul's going to take up. But of course, there are a wider set of issues that emerge as well. If you do not accept Jesus as a Jew, then how does that affect your status as a Jew? as a member of God's people descended from Abraham. Do you cease to be a Jew? Is this the end of the Jewish religion? Now, what we found in the history of Christianity is in fact, some people have answered that question in a very particular way. And then there's another question, which is the other side of that. If you're not a Jew, but you accept Jesus as your savior, how does that affect your relationship to Judaism? Uh, let me put this rather sharply. The way you became a Jew in the ancient world was by means of baptism, if you were a Gentile. And Christians are those who have been baptized into Christ. So are we in the interesting position, having been baptized, have we actually lined ourselves now with Judaism? And are we, in a certain sense, uh, sort of Jews by proxy? So the two questions there that I'm putting out on the table are one, what if you're a Jew and don't accept the Messiah? Does that disenfranchise you from the children of Abraham? And if you're a Gentile and do accept Jesus as the Messiah, does that then mean that you've actually uh, joined the Jewish faith? Those are two very interesting questions. Now, I want to translate these into contemporary idiom, because I, as I say, I don't think these are just um, ancient questions they arise in the church today. And here's uh, one of the, the series of questions I want to 
have in mind as we work our way through this material. Why do so many people reject Jesus and want nothing to do with him in our now Western culture from mostly starting in the 19th and on into the 20th century? Um, I think this is a question we need to we need to wrestle with, just as Paul had to wrestle with why did so many Jewish people not come to faith? We need to ask why is it that so many in our culture don't want to come to faith? And uh, when this is all over, I'm going to send you out a very interesting paper by uh, a chap who's actually not a believer, but who taught at the University of London. Um, and it's a paper called Christophobia and the West. And I'm going to send it out by email so that you can reflect on that. And we'll talk about, we'll, I want to talk about that at some stage. So that's one question that's the functional equivalent. And we can narrow that question and even make it more pertinent by asking this question. How come so many baptized Christians and church members reject Jesus? Uh, now, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble here and put it even more sharply. Uh, how come that so many professional theologians spend their time trying to sort of eradicate the challenge of Jesus? Why do, why do they want to tame Jesus? Why do they want to provide theories and inter interpretation of Jesus that are very far removed from anything you would find in Paul or the New Testament. Why has that happened? And why are there so many people who are committed to what uh, Archbishop Anthony Bloom called churchianity rather than Christianity? Why is that the case? Now, for those of us who are in the Methodist tradition, uh, this was absolutely a fundamental issue for uh, John Wesley and he wrestled with it all his life. But I think it's a question we need to ask while we're still in a culture, at least here in the United States, where you have large, large numbers of Christians, large numbers of people who want to be connected to the church uh, nominally, but who in many ways are either unsure of their Christian faith or in fact are not, are not at all committed to following Jesus. That, that seems to me to be a crucial question. Now, when you roll that over into the way in which Paul raises the issue in the ancient world, then the issue becomes, is, is this God's fault? Um, now, when we get into the meat of Romans 9 to 11, we're going to tackle head on uh, the hoary debates about predestination and free will that have been part of the interpretation of Romans 9 to 11 ever since the fourth century when Augustine picked it up a little he was not the only one to deal with it. But there are many people who want to say there's an easier solution to all of this. And it, it's a solution that, in fact, God never intended such people, all of these people, to be Christians. And this, it's, it's ultimately in God's hands who becomes a Christian. And there we put it this way, God is the one who is morally responsible for unbelief. Now, you can tell that I think this is a, a, a very strange position to take up and one that I will attack uh, rather relentlessly in due course. But it's the same worry that shows up here in Romans, uh, the first five or six verses of Romans, namely, is God responsible for this? Is it God's fault that we have so much church churchianity and so little Christianity? Now, uh, just a few more. I know I'm loading you up with a lot of questions, but uh, I'm an egghead, so we'll get over it. Um, here are some further questions that are on the edge of this. I'll just rattle them off because at some stage I'll want to take them up. So how are we to think of the relationship now between Jews and Christians? We still have very significant Jewish communities across the world. Every effort that's been around to wipe them out has failed. So how do we account for the continued existence of the Jewish people? And how do we, as those of us who are Gentile Christians, how do we relate to that? Is it the case that Christianity has replaced Judaism? Um, some people have argued that. There's a, even a fancy name for it. It's called supersessionism. Then alongside that, what do we make of modern Jews who accept Jesus as their Messiah? When we started the uh, Epistle to the Romans, we mentioned this as an issue. And so there's the whole issue of what we, what we make of Messianic Judaism. Uh, as you know, there are many Jews who think this is an appalling development, and there are many Christians who think this is an appalling development. So there are Jews and Christians lined up on either side, 
who say that these people call Messianic Jews, it's just a toy religion, we really oughtn't to take them seriously at all. And then lurking in the background, which I'm, I, I think I will maybe take some time on, because it's a, a real puzzle if you, if you stop and think about it. Why have Christians and others, post-Christians like the Nazis, why have they targeted the Jews and sought to eliminate Jews? Is that just a purely secular development or is there theological considerations in the background? Because it's, it's surely one of the most amazing puzzles in the whole history of Western civilization that there's been this concerted effort to get rid of Jews. And anti-Semitism, as we know, is now picking up in Europe, it's picked up in England, it's even in Ireland, it's in, in Germany and elsewhere. And it's always existed in various pockets here in the United States. So what, what do we make of that and, and, and what, we, what should we do to combat it? Now, I, I realize that's a, a lot of questions to lay out at the beginning. <laughs> Some of them have to do with the original setting in which Paul uh, finds himself about why it is that there are so many Jews who don't believe in Jesus and the questions that go with that. Some of them are on the functional equivalent of that in our day and generation. Why do we have so much nominal Christianity and often so little of the real thing? And then beyond that, a set of questions about the relationship between Jews and Christians, the emergence of Messianic Judaism, the sort of continuation of anti-Semitism, all of these are in fact, they're not front and center in this text always, but they're certainly in the neighborhood. And I want to, I want to tackle them as we, we proceed. So let me come back now to the text. Uh, this is a, an amazing outburst of, uh, what shall I say, emotion on the part of Paul. <clears throat> Uh, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And notice the massive change of tone here. Uh, it's, it's not that Paul hasn't been lyrical in the, in the, the chapter before, but this is, a, this is an incredibly different, powerful change of tone in which the man is totally heartbroken. Now, I don't want us to skip over verse 3. <clears throat> For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my fellow Jews, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now, what Paul is saying here is that he's prepared to give up a salvation for these people. Now, I just want to stop and and let you think about that. He said, put it differently, he says, I'm fully willing to be accursed, put it in bog Irish, I'm willing to be sent to hell if that would make possible the repentance and the faith of my fellow uh, Jews in Jesus. Now, there's a passion for salvation and a passion for evangelism that you rarely see in the history of the church. With, with, from a figure who has got the intellectual horsepower of Paul. So this is a man who's heartbroken. And this is one who speaks, speaks in terms that are, in some respects, just so exaggerated, you wonder if he means it. And I think he does. I'm prepared to be sent to hell if that would make possible the conversion of my fellow Jews. That's an amazing statement. Now, the reason why he's uh, so uh, concerned about this is because the Jews of all people, he wants to say, have been blessed beyond measure by God. Now, he puts it here in terms of a catalog of privileges. Um, they have the adoption. That's to say they have this very unique, special, filial relationship with God. They have the glory down through their history, they have seen the glory of God in almost tangible ways. If you think of the end of the book of Exodus, for example, they have the covenants, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, all of these covenants which God, these promises, these binding arrangements that God has made with these people. They have the law, a law which is uh, so 
so to speak, um, uh, relevant that without it, the whole country falls apart. It's, it's a law which serves the well-being and, and the, uh, the, the, the very sort of bedrock foundations of, of the nation. They have the law, they have the worship, um, and that was a pivotal part of the whole Jewish heritage. Uh, complete with its 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 daily rituals and then its its uh, yearly rituals, um, many of which were full of extraordinary joy and celebration and thanksgiving. They have all of that worship of God. They have the promises, promises which God has made to them that through through them, through Abraham, He blessed the socks of the whole world, and they have the patriarchs. They've got this lineage going back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This amazing lineage that, that everybody who's a Jew would be proud of. Proud of Abraham, proud of Moses, proud of the great founding figures of the tradition. All of that they've got. And then on top of that, here they have now none other than Christ. And Paul describes in an a extraordinary cryptic phrase, who is God over all. This is unusual language from Paul. Who is God over all um, uh, and blessed forever. Amen, as he says at the end of verse 5. Now, so what Paul's getting at here is that one of the reasons he is he's just so heartbroken and so desirous that the Jewish people will come to Jesus, that he is prepared to be sent to hell because they, they've got this extraordinary sort of outward pouring of God's blessings upon them. And then when it comes to the, the best, best blessing possible, which is the arrival of Christ, some of them somehow have said no. Now, it's worth dwelling on this for a moment. Um, uh, and, and I want to go at it from a, an, a, a sort of odd angle, you might say. What, what I'm getting at here is that the, the Jews have a unique relationship to God, and this sets them apart from everybody else in the history of civilization and in the whole history of humankind. And uh, I think it's worth reflecting on other nations and what their gifts are. Um, so I, I actually take the view that part of what's involved in, in being a nation is that nations develop characteristic skills and gifts which they can make available to other people. Um, so um, think of, of, my, of my own tribe in Ireland. Um, one, of the, one of the gifts, it seems to me, that's been well recognized by outsiders and insiders is that the Irish have a gift to the gab. And I mean that in all seriousness. <clears throat> Uh, if you go back into the ancient history of Ireland, we had an oral tradition which was absolutely astonishing. Um, they were known as bards. Uh, they were the, the top end of the of the social ladder. Um, if you were going to become an Irish storyteller, there was a, a set of training and exams that you went through, which were am amazing. For example, you, you had to know a network of stories word perfect. And in these exams, if you, if you missed a word, you were out. And, and then the kind of final thesis was you were given a topic, and on the spot, right there, you had to make up a story. And it was judged then by people who were uh, experts in all of this. And by the way, if you, if you succeeded, I like this. You, you, you got uh, several cows as the retinue, and it was agreed that when you moved from one place to another, you could stay at the, uh, at the Hilton. They, they would have to offer you special hospitality. Now, everybody knows that this then was carried over into the written uh, Irish tradition. It was the Christianity that, in, that brought an oral tradition to its written form. And even with the history of uh, the suppression of Irish in, in, in Ireland itself, there's an extraordinary body of literature 
Um, some of it's rather miserable, I have to say, when it's translated even into English. I, I didn't learn Irish when I was at school, but I have read uh, translations of some of the Irish uh, literary material, and it's absolutely incredible. And some of their short stories, for example, are out of this world. And in fact, from my own school in Enniskillen, um, we had two major figures. Um, one is Samuel Beckett, rather miserable character, if I may say so. Uh, the other is Oscar Wilde. And I remember when I was a student there, um, they, the, the Oscar Wilde's uh, name on the boards that got to the university was slightly bigger than the others. So we were sort of, we were supposed to follow in this great tradition of Irish writing. And of course, in now in English, you only have to mention someone like James Joyce or Seamus Heaney, the great Irish poet, and everybody expects the Irish to be able to get up and talk at the drop of a hat. Now, I, I don't want to exaggerate this, but the point I want to make here is, is that God in his providence has given to the nations their own unique and peculiar gifts. And, and I think, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm over the top to say that in Ireland, the gift is the gift of the gab, the gift of language. If I turn to the Greeks, just to take a few other examples, it's clearly for the Greeks, it's the gift of philosophy. I mean, the first introductory textbook you could read in philosophy is by, by Plato. Um, it's unbelievable, the uh, insight and skill that he shows and rolled over into Aristotle. These people are just amazed. Nobody else produced literature like this. Nobody else asked these questions. The Chinese didn't do it. The English didn't do it. They didn't show up. In Africa, it is an amazing gift to civilization. And the whole of philosophy, whether you like it or not, emerges out of that Greek tradition in a serious way. If you take the Roman tradition, <clears throat> then I would say one of the great gifts of, the, uh, of Rome is the gift of the Roman law. Uh, I've begun to read recently and watch on YouTube a um, wonderful Jewish lawyer uh, called Richard Epstein, uh, who got a Rhodes Scholarship and went to Oxford and by accident just simply picked up the study of Roman law. And what you'll find <coughs> is that um, everything he does is built uh, in part with his knowledge of Roman law. It's, it's an amazing, amazing gift to the wider world. And just to finish with the United States, <clears throat> now that I'm <clears throat> uh, an honorary, not just an honorary, I'm a real Texan, what, what's one of the great gifts of America to the world? Well, I would certainly say the uh, political experiment that, that's involved in the, the work of the Founding Fathers. Um, I don't say this lightly or say it casually at all. I think it's an amazing uh, uh, ex experiment in politics, and I hope one day to write about that. But really, the deepest gift that I think the Americans have is the gift of science and technology. Uh, I mean, you can see this in the current situation. Now, it's not that it's unique to America, but you're not going to get the kind of uh, um, inventions in Sweden that you're going to get <laughs> in the United States, thank God for the Swedes. I'm sure they'll invent good motor cars or something. Um, and the Israelites and, and, and many other countries will pick up on the U.S. But it's no accident that, that, that the Chinese want to steal <clears throat> our science and technology. <clears throat> and they do so because this has become an absolutely crucial gift that has developed within the contours of the United States. Uh, in some respects, I think in, in education, it, it, it it's become so, we've become so obsessive about it that we, we lose interest in other issues, but that's another topic. But what I want to say is that there's a unique set of gifts that have emerged within the United States, and they relate to, uh, I think, science and technology, as well as the extraordinary political wisdom that's built into our system. Now, I, I, I put that that way because <clears throat> I think we need to, to keep a, a kind of... Um, hang glider analysis of what's at stake here, and that what Paul is arguing, and this then is carried over into the Christian tradition, is that the Jews have a unique and special revelation from God. It is embodied in their scriptures. It's made available to us in, in what we call the Old Testament. And this is an absolute amazing treasure 
And when Paul unpacks it, he unpacks it in terms of the adoption, it, and he, he unpacks it in terms of, just let me look again, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. And then to them belong the patriarchs. And then above all else, here we should just get out the mariachi bands. It's in and through the Jews that we have been given access to the greatest gift of all time, namely the gift of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So the reason then why Paul is so heartbroken, so, uh, so utterly downcast and upset, is that they've, they've come, if you like, they've come right to the edge of the greatest gift that God could give anybody. And God has used them and prepared them for the reception of this gift. And yet many of them have said no. And what Paul is wrestling with throughout these, these uh, three, cha three chapters, I want to say, is he's trying to figure out, how am I going to make any sense of that development? Now, I'm not going to um, uh, unpack Paul's full answer at this stage, because I, I want you to actually if, acutely feel the, um, the problem that Paul's wrestling with. But the, the one thing we want to be clear about at the beginning is that what Paul is going to say, whatever is involved here, it's not God's fault. It's, it's not because God is some secret design to, so to speak, uh, shower all these gifts on, on these wonderful people, and then at the last minute after he's given them a son to pull back. That, that would be un absolutely unthinkable on the part of God. It, the one thing you can be clear about is that what God does at this stage is just. It's impartial. It's fair. <clears throat> and any answer that would uh, call that into question must be wrong. And he begins to do that immediately in, in, in verse 6. It's not as though the word of God, he says, has failed. Now, the way he's going to begin answering this question, and I'll, I'll say enough about that to tease you, the way he's going to begin answering that question is by drawing a radical distinction between being a Jew as an ethnic category and being a Jew as a spiritual category. Now, that is uh, an initially the way Paul is going to pick up and run with this, with this problem. He, he's going to say, look, it is fabulous. It is fabulous to be an ethnic Jew, to be a descendant of Abraham, uh, to be a, a, in the lineage through the flesh, through biological reproduction. It's absolutely fabulous to belong to that country, that to belong to the Jews. But you've got to distinguish between simply being an ethnic Jew who traces their lineage in nearly biological terms and what he's going to call, what I'm going to call, a spiritual Jew. One who is really taken seriously what God is actually doing in, with, and through the Jewish people. And we'll begin to unpack this next time. Now, I think, uh, again, what we get here, see, is we, we're beginning to see how this is going to play out in the history of Christianity. Because the problem of what we might call ethnic and nominal Christianity is exactly the parallel of the problem of ethnic and nominal Judaism. <clears throat> and I can speak from very direct experience here. <clears throat> um, when people ask me about my own upbringing and background, I tell them unapologetically. I was brought up a Protestant, but anti-Christian. And people sort of look at me as if I've got cauliflower ears. <clears throat> and by that I mean is that I, ha I was part of the church. I was baptized. I, I, was, uh, I went to Sunday school. And my family were part of the Christian community. But we were, uh, thankfully, we, we didn't stay there. But we were fundamentally opposed to uh, even any serious talk about who Jesus is and, and what Jesus has done. And we were, in our own way, subtle way, and sometimes very vicious way, we could be, we were utterly anti-Christian. So this parallel between being ethnic and being spiritual, belonging to the tribe, but not belonging to uh, God, that, that's nothing new uh, in 
Christianity, it's already, I think, the issue that's going to be picked up and run with by Paul. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, it's very interesting. Um, one of the big problems that exists in the Eastern Orthodox world, in places like Bulgaria and Romania and Russia, uh, insofar as the Russian tradition exists, if you have a lot of people who nominally belong to the church, but yet have no clue uh, what it is to know of the love and grace and mercy of God for themselves. And uh, Metropolitan Anthony was one of the great leaders of the Orthodox Church in London. Uh, I had a very dear friend of mine who was converted through him. Uh, my friend, actually, his name is Andrew Walker, and he was a boy wonder preacher in the Pentecostal tradition in Wales. And he was going to be the new Billy Graham. Um, and then he went to university and discovered, well, he discovered beautiful girls. And he said, well, this is too hard. And he went off and studied sociology. <clears throat> and he had heard Metropolitan Anthony on television. Um, and he did, made an, he set up an interview with him and went to see him. <clears throat> and the Metropolitan listened to him, probably for an hour or more. And then he turned to my friend and he said, Andrew, well, wh why did you really come? And that began then a journey that brought him to faith, a very living, wonderful faith in Christ. And he became a, a leading thinker in the, and still is a leading thinker in the Orthodox Church back in Britain. But Metropolitan Anthony <clears throat> has a whole book devoted to the distinction between churchianity and Christianity. So what I want to get at here is this is not a... I don't... There was... Okay, with these buttons down here, I couldn't see. They didn't... So to re return to this, <clears throat> Metropolitan Anthony is a marvelous book uh, on <clears throat> uh, churchianity against Christianity. And uh, the, the, the problem here of being ethnically a, a part of the Christian tradition, but not really deeply integrated into the Christian tradition is a problem that is all over the place. So we're, go we're going to pick this up as we, as we move forward. <clears throat> now, I, I want to finish um, uh, in this way. Um, if the Jews are extraordinarily privileged, and clearly they are, then just stop and think of the extraordinary privilege that is ours because not only do we have all of the gifts that God gave to the Jewish people, we also have the gift of the Son, and we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have come in, in Christ to know a Savior who is beyond compare. Uh, we have come to know one who is raised from the dead and alive forevermore, and is the Lord of history, however complicated and difficult it may be, to discern that, and we are committed to one who eventually is, is going to be our coming king when, as Paul put it in chapter 8, the whole of the world, even the physical world, is going to be transfigured and transformed um, to experience the full liberty that God has for us and for creation, uh, despite this rather dramatic and drastic interlude of sin. So sort of the word to myself at the end of this is, I, I don't want to be casual about, about this. Um, we need to be careful that our familiarity does not breed contempt. That we just don't get bored by the standard story of the Christian faith. <clears throat> we need to constantly recall what a fantastic gift we have. And we also need to be concerned, uh, especially as we move into I the think it's starting over. It's recorded. We need you, to be you need to mute your microphone, please. So as as we move into the future and the challenges that are going to face us both in the in the wider world and in the church world, <clears throat> one of the things I want to make sure we we do is that we is that we never underestimate this treasure and that in our own way, we develop a passion to share this with the whole world. Um, in other words, I think what's at stake here is going to be the emergence for those of us who are Methodists 
of a whole new form of global Methodism in which because we are sufficiently secure in our sense of these enormous gifts that we've been given, we're sufficiently secure that we do truly want to share this with other people. And in the meantime, <clears throat> as we're stuck in the house and as we uh, are quarantined, then I think we need to keep our nerve, we need to keep steady. Um, I'm going to finish with a quotation from um, a, a niece of mine. Uh, they were with us here in the summer. Uh, a wee girl called Tracy Wilson. Actually, she's not a wee girl now. She's a fully grown woman. She's a nurse dealing with the challenges in, in the north of Ireland. And this morning I opened up Facebook and she, she showed a, a, a lovely um, quotation from Isaiah 41 that she'd written out and, and actually made into a, a beautiful picture. And I'm going to finish with this. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will um, go back to Anne and let me see. You. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So that's the word that I would leave with all of us for uh, this Sunday morning. And I uh, appreciate very much your, your tuning into this. So let me have a word of prayer. And then if there's uh, any questions, uh, I'm sure uh, we'll be able to take those. Father, we give you thanks for the witness of the Jewish people down through the years. And we give you thanks for all of the treasures that you have given to them. And of all those treasures, we give you most thanks for the gift of your Son, our Savior, even Jesus. Father, help us to take the full measure of who he is and what he's done. And help us to lean into him and into his grace and into the power of the Holy Spirit as we as we tackle whatever the challenges that the, the, there are that we face day by day. And this we ask for his sake and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to go uh, <coughs> up in the shower. And put on the shower. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Darvel, for letting us know that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everybody, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a place where you can hit participants, and there'll be a little button that says raise your hand. Billy, do you see that? You want to put battery. So much for all of us. Tim, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> are you there yes okay um so there if you if if everyone goes to the bottom of their screen and hits participant okay you can raise your hand to ask billy a question let's see that do you see that Billy? bad <laughs> Right. Move, your, move, your, move your mouse, your cursor over the image, and then that bottom bar, and then you see these. Okay. Don Stanford, Bill Bell. <laughs> Camilla. Hey, Jeannie. Hi, Camilla. Earrings, you look great. <laughs> We have an iPad, so we don't have a cursor, I mean, a mouse. Wonderful, wonderful message. You want to leave? Before that, I want to know what they're going to talk about. Okay. Any messages? Any uh, questions for Billy? I see Arvel has his hand raised. Yes. Um, Billy, we watched for the umpteenth time last night, the Ten Commandments, and... Uh, it was interesting uh, when they came to Sinai and uh, Moses was on the mount for those many days and the people lost faith and began to fashion their golden calf and, and uh, against God. And Moses said, you know, without the law, there's no freedom. And I think of what Paul says about the law is a soul master to bring us to Christ. And it's sad that sometimes we don't make that transition from law to 
Their notion of the resurrection is, I think, you comment on that. Than, you know, what is, uh, Cam, I think we need to mute everybody. There's a lot of background noise coming in. Yeah. I hear it. Okay. And then if you want to speak, just hold, hold your, if you hold your space bar just for a moment, it will unmute you, and then Billy can call on you. So, Billy, go ahead. Hold on. Billy, you're muted. <laughs> Billy, did you hear my question? You want to come in again, Arvo? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Did you hear my question from the, the Ten hear. Commandments and the scene at Sinai? You were making a comment, and we didn't quite catch it. I didn't quite catch it. <laughs> okay, it's a little garble now. I can't hear it. Uh, I guess. We scroll down, Kim. You lost him. Scroll down, scroll down. Go down, there's purple. There he is, unmute. Okay, Billy. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I mean, I, I don't know what Arvo's question is, and I don't want to sort of just sort of mouth off on, on my comments on Exodus, which I love, actually. I mean, uh, maybe I should just do that anyway. I mean, the, the important thing about the Exodus is, is that the, the, um, the law comes after redemption. Uh, now, gosh, we're getting into, into the weeds here. Uh, but you won't really want to obey the law of God in a deep... Uh, is someone else trying to get in? Okay. Uh, you won't really want to obey the law of God unless you really believe that God is committed to your welfare. And that's the whole point of, of Exodus uh, 1 to 18. And then there's an, an amazing passage in chapter 19, which is the, the theophany. Then you get the law. Within that, uh, as Arvel was pointing out, Moses disappears. And the people say, well, maybe we, we trusted that guy and he wasn't worth trusting. So let's take things into our own hands. And you get total chaos. And then the people have got to be brought back. But notice that the final part of Exodus, uh, the really amazing final part of Exodus, is the building of the tabernacle. Because it's there now that the people come to worship God. And the final section is that the glory of God uh, falls on the people in, in, the, in chapter, the very last chapter. And if I run this off, if you remember the beginning of, the cha uh, of Exodus, what you had there was that Pharaoh was in charge. Um, and he was both top dog politically and he was top dog in terms of the spiritual world. And he, was, he felt un uh, threatened by Moses, by the possibility that there would be an entirely different God in charge of the universe. And he set out to uh, commit genocide. I mean, this is the first uh, incident uh, where you get the anti-Semitism getting to the point where you try to commit ge uh, genocide. So at the beginning, Pharaoh's in charge. At the end, when it's all over, uh, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is in charge. And the way that that is, in fact, recognized and celebrated by the people is by their building of the tabernacle and then within that entering into uh, extraordinary jubilation, celebration, praise, and joy. And then within that, the glory of the Lord comes down upon them. So the, the law here is, is sort of like set in the context of all of that. And if you, and this is where I'm coming back to the passage that we've got at this point. The law is not isolated on its own as one of the gifts, as, as the, the crucial gift. This is a mistake of Luther. Um, massive mistake by basically reducing the Old Testament to law without seeing the full sweep of the gifts that God had given to the Jewish people. Uh, and once you, you, you see that, it's not that you in any way disparage the gift of law, because as Arvel said, it is the safeguard for freedom. If, if, there's, if there's no law as we move into the current situation, 
um, you can you can be sure that anarchy will break out, and, and it's not it's no accident that people are buying guns. <clears throat> um, anarchy will break out if you don't have law. But this, dare I put it this way, this is one of the least of the gifts that was given to the Jewish people, and we have inherited <clears throat> all these other components that are there, um, and, and suitably transposed since the coming of Christ. But it's that wider set of gifts that Paul picks up here in verses one to five. <coughs> Any other questions? Um, I, I have one, but I think Peggy had her hand raised. She can go first if she'd like. Hello, uh, Peggy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Listen, I'm relaxed. Look. I'm so, I can't believe you're in a suit. It's so wonderful. You have like 50 people in your class, you know. So. Oh, so you, you, you're the you're heroine here. You pulled well, me over the edge. Well, this is awesome. Are you comfortable? Yes, I am. Good. Well, here's my question. It's a little related to what you've talked about, but in terms of how the world is looking, how, the, how our country is looking at Christians today, um, there's starting to be media reports on things like, you know, Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham's group sending up, setting up the hospital in New York, and oh my gosh, they're anti-LGBTQ, so therefore they're dangerous and need to be monitored. But I also wanted to say, I, I got an email this morning from a New York Times columnist asking me, could I put him in touch with churches that might be making a difference? So I'm anticipating that newspapers are desperately looking for oh. institutions. Oh. Uh, and it's Franklin Graham's gotten most of the attention and it's controversial. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, and this is a softball question, but if you've had some thoughts on the impact the believing church in this country could have because of the coronavirus. I know our church is doing an awful lot right now, distributing masks and, but what impact could we have in terms of evangelism through this time? Well, I, th this is a very good question. It's not an easy one because it, it requires a fair bit of hang glider sort of analysis. I noticed last night, for example, just by accident, they were covering the work of the Salvation Army in New York. And um, I, I love the, uh, the fact that people are reaching out to you to say, wh where, where's, where could we go? Um, now, I think what's the, the problem the press is facing, and this is not an anti-press comment, is they've been so secularized for so long in certain circles, they, they don't know where to look. I think one of the beautiful things that could emerge out of this is that suddenly they realize, you know, this Christian thing is, there's far more to it than the caricature that we've had of it over the years. <clears throat> And if that was to come out of this, this would be fantastic. I'm afraid I'm not a great optimist about this. I think the deeper trends within Western culture and within North American elite culture are much more with what you get with de Blasio than what you're going to get with that New York Times reporter. Now, on the details, I, I simply don't know where to begin. I, I don't have any inside track on that. <clears throat> but uh, the other straw in the wind on this and I need to look into this further, but there's a fellow called Tom Holland, who is an absolutely superb English historian. And I think he's, writ he's written a recent book, and I think the word diamond shows up within it. I'm not sure of the title. I've got it, but I haven't read it yet. Uh, but I know what it's about. And Holland was a completely secular historian. And he's become a Christian because he's actually read much more carefully the history of the Christian church and all that it has given to Western civilization. <clears throat> now, I would love to see out of the current crisis <clears throat> a kind of shakeup within intellectual circles <clears throat> in which a more balanced view of the history of Christianity would show up in, in the wider culture. But I think the jury is out on that as to whether that's going to happen. Holland may be a straw in the wind at this stage. And just, just to say, I'm going to send you, uh, I'm going to send out by email, I'll get the folk involved to do this, but a very interesting piece that was written in 2002 by a professor at the University of London who's not a Christian, 
on the on the problem of Christophobia in the you know, uh, in in the West, and the the issue there is not just intellectual opposition to Christianity, is that people they they have very negative feelings about Christianity, and I think we haven't even begun seriously the conversation as to why that is the case, <clears throat> and any future evangelistic work is going to have to get if it's going to be deep. If it's really going to be deep and lasting, in my judgment, it's going to have to take that on. Now, I think the resources are there. I think the intellectual resources are there. Um, in my own world, I'm absolutely sure of this. Um, but it's a, it's. I, I am. I am not a. I, I am very sanguine and sober as to what may emerge. And uh, and so to come back to the heart of your question, I I'm not in a position to say to know really where. Where you go looking, you uh, if there are others that are out here, may be able to find it. But uh, surely, good journalists. Uh, I mean, they're asking us to do their work for them. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> they need to get out among the people and start finding out what's happening. And uh, I mean, you can start with uh, actually some of these big mega churches. You can start there, like our own church, and you can start with. Um, uh, and then go to the rural areas and find out what's happening. I, I'm sure there are churches out there that are, are serving valiantly on the first front lines at that point. So that's, that's the best I can do about it. Yeah, thank you. No, that's what he's doing, actually. And I'm putting him in touch with Paul, and Paul will know many others. So There you go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm locked away in my egghead here. <laughs> Happily so. So I, I do have a question if no one else has. All right, Brad. Hey, Brad. So, uh, Billy, I had, um, you know, this is a really turbulent time. There's no telling what's going to happen when it all comes right. out. I've, I've given up on trying to make plans. I'm just going to wait to see yep. what, what, how it evolves. And that's part of, I heard somebody describe it to me that sometimes I want the world to evolve in a certain way but that's almost a rebellion against God because it's his world and it's going to come out the way he planned it and I need to accept that and and how does that relate to the question of people not accepting Jesus Christ as the Savior because that is God's will that is God's way oh, I, I love your move I love that question um, and I'll, I'll make a distinction here. A lot of the work that I've done has been on the kind of high-end intellectual defense of the Christian faith. Um, and I've been part of a whole generation of uh, philosophers and theologians who've, who've said, look, we're not going to cut back. We're not going to trim our seals. We're actually going to show that the arguments that you present, are most of them are very flimsy, and that a very strong case can be made for the truth of the Christian faith. <clears throat> This was especially and brilliantly represented by my own teacher at Oxford, Basil Mitchell. And I've come to the conclusion that uh, a lot of that work is purely background music. And that the really crucial objection to the Christian faith has nothing to do with, well, the problem of evil, serious as that is, or can you really believe in miracles in the age of science and so on. The really deep issue is, and is the issue of the will. Uh, that's why the 19th century uh, attack on Christianity by Friedrich Nietzsche <clears throat> uh, is is so important, because the objection that Nietzsche and company had was, we don't give a hoot about whether you, what you say is true or not. We don't like this. We want to do our thing. We and now it it came in the Enlightenment form, in terms of, of a doctrine of autonomy. That, that, that we're in charge of our own destiny, we're in charge of the world, we're going to take full responsibility for it, and the church and anybody else that stands in our way, we're going to eviscerate you. Uh, and of course, in Marxism, they did it literally. That's what they set out to do. So you have an enlightenment where you have a soft enlightenment in Britain. Uh, again, I'm going back to the more intellectual side of it. A soft enlightenment in Britain, which basically said, well, yeah, Christianity was wonderful, but too bad, it's false, we can show you the arguments against it, 
uh, but we will salvage as much of it as we can. You know, we'll still love our neighbors and we'll still be good to one another. On the Marxist version of this, which is that all of this is the opium of the masses, uh, they set out not just to ridicule us intellectually, they set out to eviscerate us, to kill us. And that's exactly what happened in the Soviet system, which is of enormous interest to me. It's been that for 40 years. Now, to come back to your point, what Nietzsche and company were insisting on was, we don't care how glorious and beautiful and wonderful this story is. It gets in our way. We have a will to power. We have a will <clears throat> to uh, be what he called an ubermensch. Um, we, we're going to be the superman of the world. And we don't give a tuppenny damn about what you think uh, or what you argue. Uh, we're just going to go for power. And this worked its way, by the way, uh, through uh, later revisions of Marxism in the 1940s and 50s and showed up in French, in France in particular, in the work of an extraordinary uh, historian and quasi-philosopher called Foucault. Uh, and and that's, what's, uh, that's what's eating uh, at the, uh, into the very heart of the non-scientific culture in the universities. So that in the literature departments or even in theology and elsewhere, what, what we have is, you know, we're not, and we're not interested in arguments. You are just in our way, you're, you are claiming privilege and uh, you're oppressing us. It's a matter of power. You stand in our way and, and we are not going to allow that any longer. Now, of course, this is where an event like this here that we're going through shatters everything. Now, I'm not going to read it in some sort of pious providential way in any kind of superficial way at this stage, but it's, it's very interesting what's happening is a lot of people who, who felt that they were running their, the universe and running their lives, uh, suddenly they are absolutely uh, a challenged to the very core of their being. Uh, suddenly they realize any of us could catch this, this uh, virus and die. And it wouldn't, in many cases, be a very, very pleasant death. And so um, what's happening in some respects uh, is that it's a bit like what happened after 9-11. Uh, suddenly people realize we're, we're at risk. We, we, we're totally innocent. We don't know where the enemy is going to come from. And now we've been hit by this. And it's going to rattle. There's no question about it. It's going to rattle people. But I'm uh, very cautious at that stage because I think often what happens is that people get rattled and then they go right back to where they were. Which is why ultimately what we're going to hear from Paul, to go back to my text, is that faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by finding out what God has done. Faith comes through proclamation. It's not through, well, I'm, uh, I'm no longer in charge of the universe. I'll now turn to God. They need to know who this God is. They need to be aware of what this God has done. They need to know that this God is committed to their welfare and so on and so forth. So all it does is create a kind of what I would call temporary space for the church to be able to speak in a very direct way, in a very powerful way. Uh, but I'm not so sure that many of the churches are in a position to do that. And that would be another story. So to come back to your fundamental point, I think that uh, the opposition and why people say no, a, a lot of it has to do with the matter of the will and not of the intellect. The, the will actually is far, far more significant than I think sometimes we have allowed. Billy? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, it's been wonderful what the church is doing in this crisis to reach out and, as Paul said today, to do what we can do for one, what we wish we could do for all. And what I would hope would come out of this would that we, we would be brought to the realization anew that uh, what's most important is not just the the saving from physical death, but saving people from eternal death. And so how can we as a church regain our nerve 
to do for that one person, that neighbor, that friend, to bear witness to, to the gospel and call them to that decision to surrender their will uh, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I mean, I realize I'm not where I was years ago in, in terms of zeal for the conversion, the salvation of those who don't know Jesus. Well, that would take longer than a haircut, Arvo. <laughs> answer that very good question. Um, and I would say two things on this. One is that you ask God to give you the words that you need. That's number one. And number two, I think we need to have which, what you might call a kind of, as a kind of elevator speech. Um, and in which when we see people who are really prepared and ready to open themselves up, I think that's very important, um, that, that this actually, <clears throat> that, we, that we are able to get them across the line. And actually, when we get to a, 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 a section later in Romans, is a fabulous passage I will draw on and may come back to your question at this stage. But I think what, what I want to get at here is, uh, and this is where Billy Graham and, and Campus Crusade for Christ and all these others have been so good. Um, they, they have the elevator speech. Namely, you say, look, if you really want to come to Christ, here's what you need to do. You need to acknowledge your sin. You need to acknowledge that the Savior has come and he's come to save you. <clears throat> And that you're here, here and now, you're, you, by praying to the risen Lord, you're going to put your faith in him, and you're, going to, and you're seek, going to seek now to live as one of his disciples in his church. And that is simple. <clears throat> so I think the issue here is that sometimes we're uh, shy, we're afraid of people saying no to us. But I think if you combine that with a radical dependence upon the Holy Spirit, uh, the kind of dependence that Jesus talked about when he said to the disciples when they were going to go to court, they were all worried, as I would be. Well, what am I going to say when the, <clears throat> the judge looks at me and all the lawyers are gathered around, and here am I, I'm a nobody. And, and the Lord said, in that very hour, the words are going to be given to you. So it's a matter of A, being dispositionally prepared in terms of being open prayerfully to what the Spirit would do, and then have a variety of what you might call elevator uh, speeches, which will help people across the line. And if you, if you want, I think one of the best ones of that is given in Romans 10, where uh, Paul says, if you, if, you, uh, if you believe in your heart, if, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In fact, it was that text, and here am I, an egghead, it was that text that got me over the line. And when we get to that passage, I'll, I'll, I'll tell that story in greater detail. So that's how I would, how I would uh, deal with that. Now, there's also a wider issue that you raise, and that is, and I've worked for 30 years with, on this, and, and certainly in Methodism, I think it's had very limited impact. I think we've got to learn how to do um, more public evangelistic uh, services, or at least introduce the evangelistic note appropriately into our preaching. Um, and that now you're off to the races, and I'm going to have to stop here. But uh, I, I'm convinced that we've dropped the ball on this. Uh, how do you preach ev evangelistic services, sermons? Um, it's got to be, it's got to be more than simply, uh, you know, going after people and trying to scare them into the kingdom. Not that the the uh, the weightiness of the issues shouldn't be brought to everybody's attention, um, but how do you preach evangelistic sermons? How do we have <clears throat> evangelistic events and campaigns, uh, those who have gone by the wayside. How do we really do that in a way that's effective and powerful? Um, and, and then um, how do we e equip the church to actually be an evangelistic church in the sense that it makes disciples? These are all issues I've written about, I've, I've thought about long and hard, uh, but that's not where you're going. And I, I go back to the earlier comment, uh, we, we, we need to be relaxed and uh, 
full of the spirit of love uh, in dealing with individuals at this stage. And I think timing is everything. Um, and only, only the Holy Spirit can help us on, uh, and I suspect, and enable us to get that right. Bill, like this is Chris. I'd like to just, as we finish today, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Um, I, I just want the, those who are still on the phone and who are still on their computers to offer up prayers this week for Lou Ann Jumper. The hospital has moved her out of her regular position and to the front desk receiving patients as they come into the emergency room. You know, could, uh, uh, you know I've been thinking about Lou Ann. And she said, she just wanted you to know that's why she's not on the phone today. She's sitting at the emergency room at the front desk. I, I, can I offer up a prayer for her as we finish? Yes, please. Our Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus. And you know how much we love Luann Jumper. You know how much we love her tenacity. Father, we love her just sort of just her lovely spirit. And we, Father, thank you for the work that she's doing. And right now, we ask that you will put a wall of protection around her. We do this unapologetically. Lord, send your holy angels, send the, all the powers of heaven, and protect her as she seeks to serve these dear people that are coming into the hospital. Help her to sleep at night, and Father, give her grace, and give her a spirit of generosity as she deals with these, these uh, suffering people, and Father, just uphold her and be with her now and, till, and until the end of this crisis, and we ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm done. <clears throat> I need coffee. All right. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Thank you, class. Y'all have a good good day.